If you're joining us new today, this message is a part of a series on boundaries. The basis of that series is that Adam was created without Eve so that Adam would know that he's God's person. And then God creates Eve. Now Adam has become a partner, but he's not primarily a partner. He's primarily God's person. And Eve is primarily God's person, not Adam's partner. And then God gives them children. They're not primarily parents. They're both primarily God's person. Second, they're primarily each other's mate, partner. And then third of all, they are parents. Children are given to us when those children are not primarily ours. They're primarily God's. We might have been a part of biology, but God is the one who created those children. If you remember, he said to Jeremiah in 1.5, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. So God is the one who came up with the idea of you, not your parents. And then he selected and placed you in the womb of a mother and gave you two parents. So these children are God's, not really ours. We're primarily stewards. We're not owners. Now, the marriage was to be permanent till life do depart kind of thing. Uh, the, the raising the kids was to be temporary. You raise them and then they go out and be their own people with their own families. Now last week I began a two-part series on boundaries in children. This is the second part of that message. Parents are God's primary agent to teach, to guide, and shape the children God gives to them. Last week's message was on how God parents us. Today is more about how we parent our kids. Now, as most of you know, this, this morning's message will play on TV this Saturday morning at nine from nine to 10 on uh, my VLT. And so last week's message played yesterday. At 10.05, I got a message, I got a text from a guy. He had my number because his father died some time ago. We don't really have a relationship. But uh, if I called his name, everybody in Gibbs would know who he was. And uh, he's, a, he's a lifetime school teacher. And five minutes after the program, I got a text. And here's, here's what he said, quoting. Really random text, but just happened to see your message on TV re regarding raising children. As a 30 plus year public school teacher, the message should be required viewing for all parents. I've seen so many enablers through the years that couldn't see how much they stood in the way of their kids. Keep preaching the word, exclamation, God bless. Parents are supposed to be the greatest asset in a child's life. But if they don't do it right, they become the biggest problem, the biggest liability. They're supposed to be the solution. If you fail to parent God's way, you can become a big part of your child's problem. Children are given to us in a pliable condition. We're bigger than they are. We know more than they know. We have experience they don't have. God planned it that way. They're born as broken sinners just like we were. Proverbs 22, 6 tells us that we're to train up a child in the way he should go. Why? Because if he's not trained in the way he should go, he will go in the way he should not go. Proverbs 29, 15 tells us that a child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. The King James translates it this way, a child left to himself. It's the same thing. What he's saying is, if a child gets to do what a child wants to do, someday his parents will be brought shame because of it. He will not choose well. Obviously, record numbers of kids are getting their own way and being left to themselves these days, right? Years ago, the Minnesota Crime Commission came out with this statement on raising kids, and I quote, every baby starts life as a little savage. He is completely selfish and self-centered. He wants what he wants and when he wants it, his bottle, his mother's attention, his playmate's toy, his uncle's watch. Deny these and he seethes with rage and aggressiveness, which would be murderous were he not so helpless. He is in fact dirty. He has no morals, no knowledge, no skills. This means that all children, not just certain children, are born delinquent. If permitted to continue in the self-centered world of his infancy, given free reign to his impulsive actions to satisfy his wants, every child would grow up a criminal, a thief, a killer, a rapist. End of quote. In the parable of talents, we learn that doing nothing is a big sin. In the parable of the sheep and goats, it's where I was hungry and you fed me or I was hungry and you didn't feed me. We learn there that, what we, that not doing what we ought to have done can cost us our eternity. 
So children, all children are broken by sin and they're bent toward doing what is wrong, not what is right. Now the only exceptions to this are my grandchildren and of course yours. Now I'm being facetious. You learn this pretty quickly. Here's, here's how a toddler views property. If I like it, it's mine. If I could take it away from you, it's mine. If I had it a while ago, it's mine. If I say it's mine, it's mine. If it looks like mine, it's mine. If I say I saw it first, it's mine. If you're having fun with it, it's mine. If you lay down your toy, it's mine. If it's broken, it's yours. Okay, that's just the way toddlers see life, right? True and recent story at our preschool. A cute, cute little girl was in her own little world pretending she was preparing a meal at the little stove in the classroom. She was really enjoying herself, so some of the boys wanted in on it. So rather than the teacher asking or telling her uh, to share, the, the teacher goes over and says, are you sharing? And just as serious as she could be, she looked at her and said, no, I'm cooking. <laughs> now this is absolutely adorable for a kid this age, but it's not adorable for older children, teenagers, and adults not to share. On the front page of the outline, I have the points and the verses from last week's message. I'm going to read the points, not the verses. Let's go. And last week, I talked about how perfect Heavenly Father parents. I may give just a one-line comment on each of these. Number one, His love for us is based upon who He is, not who we are. Our love for our children should be based upon how we love, not how they behave. I love you because I'm your father. And because of that, there's nothing you can do that I will not love you. Number two, God wants us, but he doesn't need us. If you need your children's approval, then you can't lead them. If you need them, they have the power, not you. Number three, if we submit to God, we both win. If we don't, we both lose. When we do God's will, obviously, we get the best life we can have, and God gets the life he wanted us to have. Same way with your kids. Your children can do well in life if you lead them well and tell them what to do. In fact, if you're a good parent, probably every mistake your child has made uh, that was a choice against what you want them to do was because they didn't listen to you. And how many times as a parent do you say, if you just listen, if you just done what I said, if you just done what I asked you to do. Number four, God rewards us when we obey him. Never reward bad behavior. That's what the enemy does. Number five, if God allows us to pay the penalty when we disobey him, he lets us reap what we sow. He lets us get ourselves out of the mess we got ourselves into. If we will, we will learn our greatest lessons through our biggest mistakes. When you make a real whopper, and I've made several, and you pay for those whoppers, you'll never make that whopper again. Great teachers. But if a parent rescues a child from the consequences of their decision or behavior, then no, the only lesson they learn is, no matter what I do, I don't get punished. I get away with it. And that's what a lot of kids have learned from their parents. Number six, God doesn't do for us what we can do for ourselves. The older your children get, the more responsibility you give them. You don't pick up their clothes for them. You don't make their bed for them. You don't clean their room for them. The older they get, the more they're expected to do. Number seven, God is more interested in our character than our comfort. We really laid down on this one hard last week. You have to care more about how your child turns out than you care about how they feel about you. As I said last week, your job is not for them to think that you're greatest, you're the greatest, but your job is for everybody who knows them to think that they're the greatest. And if they're the greatest, you're probably pretty good. So that's your job. You gotta care more about their character than their comfort. Number eight, God is more interested in giving us joy than making us happy. God wants to give us joy. Jesus had joy at the cross. You can have joy in any circumstance, but you can't have happiness in every circumstance because happiness is an emotion that depends on surroundings and circumstances that are favorable. But you can have joy when the surroundings and circumstances are everything you wish they weren't. You can be okay when life is not okay. Your job is not to make your children happy. Your job is to teach your children how to be happy. If you try to make your children happy, you'll become the reason later in life they'll never be happy. 
Making your child happy is giving your child his own way. We let them have everything that they want. We let them do everything they want to do. We let them get away with every behavior they might choose. Now, people won't do that for him or her in the real world. They'll get thrown in jail. They're, they're made to leave them. They'll get fired from the job. So if you, teach, if you raise your kid like that, you're preparing them for a world that doesn't exist outside of your home. They'll fail. They'll have no coping skills for when they don't get their way. And you don't get your way a lot in the real world, right? So you gotta teach them how to choose and live with joy even when life is robbing them of what they wished was. Now turn your outline over and let's ask ourselves some questions. And so these are just some, kind of some questions and I'm gonna fill in some answers. And some of these, I'm not gonna particularly give you an answer. It's a, it's a question for you to answer. So here's the first one. Am I seeking to raise adults or children? You gotta decide which one you're raising because it's two completely different skill sets. We raise children when we give them everything they want. We raise, raise children when we let them do whatever they want to do. We raise children when we, bail, when we bail them out of trouble rather than letting them face the consequences of their bad decisions. We raise children when we fail to correct their bad behavior. And children don't grow up because they have another birthday. They grow up when they learn the skills to be mature. And so now we have this thing called adolescence. And so we've got these 20 and 30-somethings, more often boys than girls, who've never grown up. They don't want to be men. They want to be boys. They want to play video games, have a job that's fun. I think work is supposed to be a synonym for fun. It's not. And, uh, and they want an easy life. They don't want to be responsible for anything or anybody. You know, this is probably the first generation that's ever been like that. Several years ago, the Houston Police Department published what they called a father's guide to making a delinquent child. They said 10 things. Number one, begin at infancy to give the child everything he wants. In this way, he will grow up to believe the world owes him a living. Number two, it's interesting, when, the, uh, when they were uh, holding out on the stimulus money uh, and they hadn't passed it yet, they were, somebody wrote on Nancy Pelosi's door, apparently, they vandalized her house and wrote on her door, we want our money like the government exists to take care of them. The government doesn't exist to take care of you, the government exists to protect you. It's your job to take care of yourself. The Bible says if you don't do that, you're worse than an unbeliever. Number two, when we use bad words, when, they, when he uses bad words, laugh at him. That'll make him think he's amusing. Number three, never give him any spiritual training. Wait until he's 21, let him decide for himself. Number four, pick up everything he leaves lying about, books, shoes, clothing, do everything for him so that he'll be experienced in throwing all responsibility onto others. Number five, quarrel frequently in his presence. In this way, he'll not be too shocked when the home is broken later. Number six, give the child all the pocket money he wants. Never let him earn his own. Why should he have things as tough as you have them? Number seven, satisfy his every craving for food, drink, and comfort. Denial may lead to harmful frustration. Number eight, take his side against neighbors, teachers, policemen. They're all prejudiced against your child anyway. Number nine, when he gets into serious trouble, apologize for yourself by saying, I could never do anything with him. Number 10, prepare for a life of grief. You're bound to have it. Now again, that's, that's the Houston Police Department talking about how to raise a delinquent. Pretty good list. Good stuff. Raising adults versus children requires a whole different game plan. One teaches responsibility, one makes excuses. Well, I know I should, but... And let me say this to those of you who are no longer with the other child's parent. Bear down on this, don't abandon it. I'm gonna come back to that. Here's number two, second question. Am I, am I training my children or are they training me? Am I training my children or are they training me? 
We've probably all been in a store or the mall or someplace where children, uh, where a child pitched a fit. We used to call them hissy fits. I don't know what a hissy is, but it's a hissy fit. And so they, they just pitch a fit because they want that thing. Mom and dad don't want them to have that thing, don't think they ought to have that thing, but boy, they pitch a fit. They start crying. If they're little, they pull the collapso. You know that move where they fall down and triple their body weight and you're trying to pick them up and they just can't hardly get them up? And usually, if you'll observe this, before long, the parents will do the obedient thing, submit to their child, and give them what they want so the child will quit crying. Now, if that was my child, I'd say, here, I'd say this many times to my kids. You, you want to cry? You need a good reason? I'll be glad to provide it, okay? Be glad to provide it. But what that child is doing is he's raising parents, and if he gets away with it, he'll run their lives for the rest of his life. And I bet some of you today, your child is running your life. They always have. Because you've always let them get away with it. You've always felt sorry for them. Maybe the home broke and you felt sorry for them for that. So now rather than being a parent, you've become their friend. And becoming their friend, frankly, you've become their enemy. You've at least become the enemy of what God wants to do in their lives. Are you raising obedient children or are they raising obedient parents? Do you cave in when they pitch fits or pout in order to punish you? You know that's what they're doing. They're punishing you. And they do this at the age of two, maybe earlier. If you don't teach them to respect you, they probably will never respect anybody. And we saw those on the streets during these riots this past year. It's a Black Lives Matter riot or, or a peaceful protest, okay? And there's a black man in front of his store saying, I'm one of you, I'm one of you. And they still destroy his store. Why? Because they don't respect anybody and they don't respect any property. It doesn't matter if somebody owns that property. It doesn't matter if this is this man's business and he's about to lose it. All that matters is them and what they want to do. That's how they were raised. And that's what they're, they're acting it out. The rights we witnessed last year were perpetrated by people who have no respect for property, authority, or other people. And policemen would tell you this. Be, you know, in the past, a policeman put the fear. Everybody, you saw a cop, you had fear. All you older people, you see one behind you, don't you slow down? I mean, you might be going 15 in a 40 zone, but you'll hit the brakes. Now these cops have people just look in their face and defy them. Dare them to touch them while their friend's videoing them. Am I training my children or are they training me? Number three, left to themselves, well, my children tend to turn out good or bad. What do you believe? The Bible says they'll turn out bad. Look at Romans 3, 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Proverbs twenty two fifteen foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. Uh, so he's talking there about uh, how, how you've got to correct the bad behavior. Now you do this differently as they age. When a child is small, you spank them. Why? They, you can't reason with a two-year-old, but they can know that every time I touch that, my rear end catch, catches fire, okay? They can figure that out. And they'll say, I'm not going to touch that anymore. As they get older, it's less physical, it's more reasoning. But you always have to have the power to, to, to do something that's going to affect their behavior. The day you don't have that power, you just lost. You lost. We're not sinners because we sin, we sin because we're sinners. You don't have to teach your children to lie, to steal, to be selfish. All they got to do is act naturally. Look at Proverbs 29, 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. Listen closely. You do this wrong and you'll have a lifetime of grief over your children. And if you, give it, you get it right, you'll have a lifetime of joy. Now, it's usually mixed with both. But it can be primarily and almost all one or the other depending on what you do with this. All of us want to be proud of our children. Good behavior is learned. It's not innate. Again, people don't mature because they have birthdays. They mature because they've learned skills. A child permitted to act like a jerk will be a jerk until somebody jerks it out of them. And that's your job as a parent. 
There was a mother, she was a doctor, and she was taking her child to preschool, and, and on the way, she had her stethoscope laying in the back seat, and, and she looks back in the rearview mirror, and her child, and the little girl's picked up the stethoscope, and she's thinking, oh, maybe my baby will be a doctor someday. So a little kid puts the stethoscope up to his mouth, say, welcome to McDonald's, what would you like? <laughs> well, maybe not a doctor. And you'll go through this. Another father was exasperated with his teenage son. So he tells his son, said, son, with Abraham Lincoln, who now, you know, is a bad guy. He's a bad guy. San Francisco's going to take his name off of school. Apparently freeing the slaves wasn't enough. So anyway, he said, son, when Abraham Lincoln was your age, he walked 12 miles to school. Smart little boy said, dad, when Abraham was your, Lincoln was your age, he was president. That didn't go well, did it? <laughs> kind of backfired on him. Children have to be taught what kind of behavior is acceptable. What you show, what you don't show. What you touch, what you don't touch. Where you put your feet, where you don't put your feet. Where you put your hands, where you don't put your hands. They have to be taught everything. Every single thing they do, you got to teach them. It's an exhausting job if you haven't figured that out. So they got to be taught. Now here's the fourth question. And I've already tapped on this from last week. Do I need my children's approval? Do I need my children's approval? Rather than living in fear of what your kids might do if they mess up, they should live in fear of what you might do if they mess up. Are you afraid of what they might do or are they afraid of what you might do? Have your children looked you in line and said, I hate you? If they haven't, you probably haven't been a parent because you've done everything in your power to avoid that. You want them to like you. And the good news is you can, you can behave in such a way that they'll like you. The problem is nobody else is going to like them. Here's question number five. Is my primary goal the happiness of my children or the development of, my, of their character? I've got to pick one or the other. I can't have both necessarily. Look at Hebrews 12, 10 and 11, I put in your outline. He disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. That's the point. You never correct a child because you're angry. In fact, if you are angry, cool off before you do. The point of correction is not you're angry. The point is co cor of correction is you love this child and you want this child to be the kind of person people will like. Not people will hate. The kind of child you'll be proud of, not embarrassed by. The kind of child who'll be a productive citizen, not go to prison. Verse 11, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Get an amen for that. Yet to those who've been trained by it, afterwards it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness. You gotta care more about who your child becomes than you care about how he feels about you. Love for your child cares about them who they're becoming. Listen closely. Needing to be loved by them isn't caring about your child. It's caring about yourself. It's selfishness. I want to feel loved. And if I don't give him that, if I correct them for that, they're not going to love me right now. And so I would rather let them misbehave and feel loved then be mad at me and learn to do the right thing. And let me tell you, that's the way most parents parent. Most. I don't know how big that majority is, but it's definitely most. And let me add this. You gotta care more about who your child's becoming than you care about how other parents think you parent. Most parents aren't doing this well. If you're doing a great job, you've got standards they don't have. They do things at their house you, will do, you wouldn't let it happen at your house. And they may think you're too hard or you're too this. Most parents have surrendered to their kids. If you do this right, you're going to be the odd man out. Here's a special warning to parents who no longer live with the other child's parent. The temptation, and this is one of the reasons God hates divorce. God doesn't hate divorced people. He loves people who are divorced. He hates divorce because it hurts people he loves. Say, so who's it hurt? Everybody. Hurts the church. Somebody leaves. Hurts the dog. Somebody gets the dog. Somebody doesn't. Hurts the couple. Now their lives are far more complicated. 75% of people who divorce later regret it. 
It hurts the children. Why? Because typically now, parents quit parenting, and what they do now is they start competing for the child's affection so they can win versus the other parent. Am I in the right room? And so they quit parenting. And they love themselves. I want my child to love me. When, Betsy, when our kids were young, I'd come home from work and, and uh, Betsy would meet me at the, at the door crying. I said, what's wrong, honey? She said, all I do is beat them all day long. They're going to hate me. They adore her. They adore her. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Years ago, we, had a, we did a thing with the youth. It's a real cool thing. We got the, got the A through L, I think it was, kids, and put them with the M through Z parents, and vice versa. So no kid was with their parent. We're in two large groups. And every kid got to say what they wished their parent knew. And every parent got to say what they wished their kid knew. So you're not hearing it from your mom and dad. You're hearing somebody else's mom and dad. Got the picture? I'll never forget this one guy who said, I wish my dad would correct me. He never does. And this teenage boy did not interpret that as my daddy loves me. He interpreted that as my daddy doesn't. If God disciplines those he loves, then you discipline those you love or you're not like him. You can't end up in a game competing. You gotta care more about that child, how he, who he becomes, than you do about how he feels about you at the moment. That great theologian, Lily Tomlin, remember her? She once said, if, you're, if your child's never said, I hate you, you've never been a parent. It's probably true. You don't have children because you need someone to love. If that's what you need, get a cat, okay? You don't have children because you need someone to love you. If that's what you need, don't get a cat. Get a dog, <laughs> right? Needing to be loved pretty much guarantees your child will be in charge. They'll make the rules and you'll follow them. You have children because you're mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, and financially able to give that child what it needs. It's selfish to have children because you want one. That is so self-centered. You have children because your marriage, your place in life, I can, give to, I can have a child and give a child what he needs. I can give that child what God wants me to give that child. That's why you have kids. People who don't have children romanticize what it's like to be a parent. Being a parent is the hardest job you'll ever undertake. Can I get an amen? amen. They'll scare you to death at times. They'll break your heart at times. They'll make you at times understand why the animal kingdoms, the parents eat their young. <laughs> Explain that to your neighbor. You want to hug them one day, you want to hold them the next day, you want to send them in the next life on the third day. At times you're going to feel like you're in a war over how long the skirt is or how they want to wear their hair or some other thing, who they want to be with, what they want to do, what they want to go to. Sometimes it'll be a war. And if you're not up to a war, don't have kids. Don't have kids. Parents need to figure out what kind of person they're trying to raise. Y'all do have a baby. Y'all say, what are we wanting to turn this kid into? Because this kid's all pliable. He, he or she doesn't know anything. What do we want this kid to be? So make a list. We're wanting this kid to be all these things. Now, here's your second thing. You put, okay, if we're wanting this kid to be honest, what will we do to help that kid be honest and make sure that he's not dishonest? Figure it out. We want our child to treat everybody the same, no matter their money, their education, or their skin color. So what kind of behavior do we need to have that teaches that child to do that? And what kind of behavior will teach that child to do all those things we don't want to do? You figure it out. And then you work on your game plan. So what do I want my children to learn? I've kind of put you a starter list in here. Number one, how to, how to respect people in authority. They respect people in authority. They respect people in authority because they learn to respect you. 
and you teach them to respect people authority. They fear policemen because they fear you. They fear their school teacher because they fear you. But they're kids who don't fear anybody. Most of them hadn't had a dad around. And you teach them how to respect property. You buy them this new toy, they break it. You don't buy them another one, you go, oh, shucks. You gotta learn to take care of stuff. And they might just learn a lesson, they do it again. Oh, sorry, you gotta take care of property. If you do that, they're never gonna burn somebody's store down. It won't happen. But the kids don't have any respect for property, they don't have any respect for people. And so we got a mess. Number two, how, how to relate to proper authority. How to relate to proper authority. Now, if you understand, I did a couple of messages where I talked about a whole bunch of factual details, but this whole, whole thing about how cops treat people of color. The truth is, more white people, way more white people die in, in encounters with police than they do with people of color. There's way more people uh, proportionally in encounters with police who are people of color. But the bottom line is this. If, if, you're, if somebody tries to arrest you and you do what the policeman says, you've got about a point, oh, 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 1% of something bad happening. But if you attack the policeman or you resist arrest, there's a chance something might happen. It doesn't, care, it doesn't matter what color your skin is. So what's the problem? The problem is p teaching people how to respond to proper authority. You got these basketball players coming out and, and, and joining in the crusade. Why don't they come out and tell people how to behave? Why don't they come out and say, stop breaking the law. Chicago, stop killing yourself. Quit shooting your own people. If a policeman pulls you over, do what he says to do. If you think it's unfair, get that fixed later. I'm Rocky Ramsey and I approve this message. <clears throat> And I'm probably the least racist person in this room. So don't think anything I said had anything to do with race. It had to do with facts. Now here's number, th number three. How to be a giving, other-centered person. How to be a giving, other-centered person. You teach them how to share. You teach them how to give. So like we're doing this stuff for these COVID people. You ought to get some stuff with your small kids, tell them what we're doing with it, and have them bring and put that, that in that pile. We're going to have the kids bagging it up to take to the floors. They're going to be learning to think about and care about other people. And you do that with your children all the time. You just forever teach them how to think about other people, how, you ha how to have manners, how to, if you go through a door, you look behind, if somebody's come behind, you hold the door for them. If you're going up to a door and you're about eating with somebody, hurry ahead of them and open the door and hold it for them. See, some people go through life and they're forever thinking about the people around them. And some people go through life and they're never thinking about anybody around them. They drive too. If you've noticed that. Now here's number four. You teach them how to choose happiness. You didn't make the cheerleading. You didn't make the basketball team. You didn't make the whatever. You don't go to school and hire an attorney. You teach them how to deal with not getting their way. They're going to have to do a lot of that. And if they don't learn how to do that, they're going to be on drugs. They're going to become alcoholics because that's they can't cope. Number five, you teach them how to take care of themselves. I put four things under that. Number one, you teach them a work ethic. You put them to work. If you've got a middle school boy, you shouldn't be mowing your yard, raking your leaves, doing any of that kind of stuff. If you've got a little girl, she ought to be cleaning the table. Guys can do this too. I do it in my house. I do everything my wife tells me to do. Anyway, I'm a smart man. <laughs> but you understand? You don't take their dishes over, they take their dishes over. You don't put them in the dishwasher, they put them in the dishwasher. You don't rinse them, they rinse them. You're trying to teach them how to be somebody. You know, well, I don't want my kids to have as hard as you. Well, I don't know about you, but I think I turned out pretty good and I had it real hard. In fact, for the most part, the people I think have turned out real good had it real hard. And about everybody I think that turned out bad didn't. People, at least people I know. I, I got a friend I grew up with. He's this close from homeless. He had way more advantages than I had. Way more. 
I learned I had, if I was going to have anything, I had to work for it. Nobody's going to do anything for me. Nobody's, I didn't have a daddy to bail me out, give me money. I'd have to get out there and earn it. So you teach them how to do this. You teach them how to be happy. You know what? You can be okay when life isn't. Yeah, everybody doesn't make the team. Everybody doesn't get that, that award. You do your best, and that's what matters most. Praise effort, not achievement. Everybody can't make straight A's. Some kids can make them without trying. You don't praise achievement, you praise effort. Now here's the, we're talking about the taking care of ourselves. Work ethic, teach them how to work. Uh, number two is health. Teach them how to take care of themselves. Make them move. I'm kidding, but hook them up to the back of your pickup and drive them around the yard. Make them run. <laughs> you got a little obese child. Just, take, just stay with me here. I'm not being mean. I'm trying to help you. You think that child is going to have the same life as this kid over here who's healthy and, and, and fit? Somebody give me an answer. No, not even close. It's a big deal. Man looks on the outward appearance. Remember, that's biblical. You go apply for a job, you go try to get a date, you go whatever you do. It makes a difference. And so you teach your child how to be healthy. Now here's the third thing, decision making. You teach them how to make decisions. You tell them why. You say, well, here's why we do that. Why? And here's why we do it. And they want to, then as they get older, you say, well, what do you think you ought to do? Well, why do you think you ought to do it that way? Well, why wouldn't you do it that way? So what you're doing is you're teaching them how to think. You're teaching them how to process information and come to good conclusions. So you teach them how to decision make. Some people make bad decisions all the time. And some people almost never do. All of us make them every once in a while. The fourth thing you teach them is how to manage money. How to manage money. All these years, there have been people around me who had the same amount of money I had or less who could afford things I couldn't afford. Okay? I could afford a retirement, but I can't afford a $5 cup of coffee. I can't afford a, you know, a $100 pair of blue jeans. I can't afford that. I could, but I can't. You understand? Teach them how to manage money. Because a whole lot of the problem is not how much you're making. The whole lot of the problem is how much you're spending. People who don't have money spend money on all kinds of things that people with money would never spend money on. So you teach them how to manage money. That's, gonna be, that's an important skill as they get older. And here's number six. You teach them how to love God and to be who they were made to be. You model it, you bring them to a church, you talk about it. They're thinking about college. Well, son, the most important thing is not what you do for a living. The most important thing in life is who you become. And so you need to decide, what is it God made you to do? And then based on that, it, would this be a fitting career for you to be in? You see, that's how you, you don't get that backwards. Now, here's the final question I'm going to address. Number six. What do I owe my children? Oh, I love this one. One of my favorites. It's real simple. You owe them three things. Number one, you owe them food. If you're not feeding your kids, you're a bad parent. We'd all agree to that, okay? You owe them food. Number two, you owe them shelter. And you might put slash protection. You owe your child shelter protection. Protection from weather, housing, and clothes. Protection from what might harm them. Protection from might who harm them. Might, you know, who might harm them, including friends. You need to be checking their friends out. And there ought to be some people that they might like to be friends with you're not going to permit. Because they'll hurt them. And you've got to protect them from themselves. Every teenager thinks he's more mature than he is. How many of you parents would agree with that because you were one too? Come on. Oh, you can handle anything. I'm 15. You know? And so a part of your parents' job, young person, is to have the wisdom to protect you until you're mature enough and experienced enough to know how to protect yourself. Because without it, young girl, you'll get date raped. You'll get date raped. And without a young guy, you'll end up somewhere with a bunch of guys, maybe, maybe in a car wreck, dead, maybe in sitting in jail because you're a bunch of guys doing stuff. Maybe you didn't even do it, but you're with them. 
So a parent's job is to protect the child. You got to discern what they can and cannot ha handle. Now here's the third thing you owe them. It's the last one is love. Love. Now put in your outline, by that I mean affection. That's love. If you have rules without relationship, you get rebellion. So you got to have affection. And then you have direction. You teach them what they ought to do, show them where they ought to go. And third, you have correction. The Lord disciplines those he loves. When they're not doing what they ought to do, you correct them. Not because you're mad, not because you don't like them, but because you absolutely love them. And you want everybody else to love them. And you know, if they keep doing that, everybody else is not going to love them. Listen closely and real closely to every word I say for the rest of this message. It won't be long. I don't know my child a smartphone. I don't know my child designer clothes. I don't know my child a trip to Disney World. I don't know my child permission to do what parents or other parents allow their children to do. Most parents are really parenting poorly. I don't know my child a car. I don't know my child chasing them all over town or state so they can play ball. I don't know my child musical, athletic, or any other kind of paid lessons. I don't know my child a $500 prom dress, a limo for the prom, a senior trip. I don't know my child college tuition. I owe my child food, shelter, and love. Oh, that's gravy. You don't know your child everything you can afford to give him or her. Listen closely. Who you owe is God. That's who you owe. You owe him to get this right. You owe him to do a good job with this child he has given you and given you the responsibility to turn into the person God made that child to be. That's who you owe. You ought to him not to ruin that child. When we became grandparents, you know, a lot of people just say this being silly. Maybe, I'm, I'm hoping so. But everybody says, oh, grandkids are great. You can just spoil them, send them home. Bet you and I have never spoiled our kids and we've never spoiled our grandkids. The last, I, I'd rather not have grandchildren than have a bunch of brats. Wouldn't you? A bunch of spoiled brats. Nobody likes them every time you're around. As soon as people leave, everybody's talking about them. Could you believe how that kid behaved? And the parents did nothing. I don't want a spoiled brat kid or grandkid. I want a kid, people go, you see how sharp those kids were? See how manner they were? How respectful they were? See how well behaved they were? How energetic they were with mine anyway. You owe it to the Lord to raise a good human being. A well-adjusted, functioning adult. And obviously, we have a lot of adults who aren't that. Your job is to train your child not to spoil him. Your children need your presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E -E, more than they need your presence, P-R-E-S-N-E-N-T-S. -E there are many kids who've been raised to be wonderful people who did not get any of the things I just mentioned. They're caring, happy, hardworking, faithful people. They had none of that. On the other hand, there are kids who've been given all the above and they're absolute messes. Listen real closely to what I'm about to say. Affluence is a liability in raising kids. It is not an asset. It's a liability. Money enables you to raise entitled brats. Private schools are full of them, including Christian schools. It makes you mad. If it makes you mad that I'm saying that, you probably have one. If you don't have one, you know that's not true of you. I didn't say it was true of everybody. But I bet you know it's true too. People think, well, Christian schools, they're just like heaven on earth for kids. <laughs> that's Greek for you don't know. <laughs> Lack of money doesn't by any means guarantee that kids will turn out good, but it does probably mean that they won't feel entitled and they won't be arrogant. And some people with money, with their kids in private schools, who are giving their kids nearly everything on that list, actually are doing a great job at parenting. The point of that long list is this you don't owe your child those things. 
It's not, a, it's not their right to have them. If you can't give them, then you can still be a great parent. Likely better than a lot of the parents who are giving the kids all that stuff. If you can afford to give your child all those things and more, make sure that they're earning those things by their good behavior and that you're not trying to earn their love by giving them those things. And I'm telling you, you'll have to get real honest with yourself to answer that question and get it right. They're earning those things. This kid deserves it. Not, I'm afraid of my kid. They're not going to like me. I better keep them the stuff. Everybody else's parents are giving them that stuff. You're in trouble if that's where you are. Make sure that they're grateful, not entitled. Make sure that they know that all these things don't make them better people. And they sure don't make them better people than people who don't have those things. You're not a better person because you came to prom in a limo. You're not a better person because you got the newest iPhone. It just means somebody's got money. Doesn't have anything to do with your character, of, of, of what kind of decent person you are. It has nothing to do with that. Make sure that they remain humble. Make sure they know that they're just fortunate. If you see a drop of arrogance in your child, strip them of whatever you need to take away to teach them humility. The moment you get a drop of arrogance and entitlement, boy, you just cut that thing back. You know, when you learn to be grateful, when you learn to be appreciative for what you have, and when you learn that you're not better than anybody else who doesn't have it just because you have it, then we might do this again. We might restore this privilege. But until then, we will not. Because I care a whole lot more about the person you're going to be than I do you being popular. Make sure to remind them that in God's kingdom, the greatest people are who? Servants. That the strong serve the weak. The rich serve the poor. The powerful serve those without power. Primarily praise them for character, not for achievements or appearance. Their character. Tim Tebow's, uh, I don't know if it's him or his dad wrote the book. Betsy read it. He, Tim Tebow, he said, well, you know, he's, he's quite the guy, to say the least. And uh, he, he, he still kept, kept being who he always was. You know, what, you know what his dad did? His dad never gave an ounce of praise for his achievements. He won, what, he win uh, one uh, Heisman Trophy or did he win two? He won two national championships. But anytime he was nice, his dad would give him money. Give him a dollar when he was a kid. Every time he had his character, his dad would give him something. But when he was the MVP and when they just won the state and when they won the, uh, the NCAA, his dad would maybe say, I'm proud of you, but it was no big deal. You wonder how Tim Tebow turned out the way he is. Kurt Warner, another quarterback in the NFL, if you remember his name. Uh, Kurt Warner would take his kids to restaurants. And part of what he'd do is to make every one of his children look the waitress in the eye and remember their name. And he would have them do something kind. And then they, every time they would look around the restaurant and say, okay, we're going to find somebody in this restaurant. We're going to buy their meal. Everybody find a person and we're going to debate who's going to, get pay, who's going to get their meal paid for today. What's he doing? He's teaching his children. He's training them. They're going to always be thinking about others. They'll never sit in a restaurant without looking around. Tim Tebow will always know that his character, his virginity means more than his Heisman. Because his dad got it right. Another warning for the more fortunate among us. Beware of the need to show off your success by the things you can give your children. While well, your child's driving a... You must be doing pretty good. Yeah. You need to care more about your kid's character than do your own ego or place in society. Remember, you owe God. And someday you're going to stand before him 
And you're going to give account of what you did. The kind of people they become, what regular people think about them, that's your goal. Not what they think about you because what you keep giving them. Likely the most important emotional skill that you can teach your kid is how to think and behave when he doesn't get what he wants. Well, obviously he can never learn that if he always gets what he wants. I want this dress. No, honey, we can't afford that dress. Or we're not paying that kind of money for that dress. Maybe we can afford 50 of those dresses. But we're not, trying, we're not going to pay that kind of money for that dress because I'm trying to raise a, a, a decent young lady, not an entitled person, who thinks they've got to have the best of everything and thinks they're better than everybody because they do. Am I on the right planet? If your child can learn the skill of being happy when he doesn't get his way, he's going to have a good life. Your child may not always think that you're the greatest getting him or her there, but people one day will think they're the greatest. And God will look down and think you did a great job. 